Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Mega Chile Pluto. No, giant bees aren't something out of a bee movie. They are real and were actually thought to be extinct. Surprise, they aren't. Found on a group of Indonesian islands, these bees are also called flying bulldogs. You might actually confuse it for a bird. It was first discovered in 1858 by British naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, hence its common name, Wallace's giant bee. Mega Chile Pluto is four times larger than a European honeybee, making it the world's largest bee. Normally found in the lowland forest and in tree-dwelling termite nests, they were thought to be extinct until being rediscovered in 2019. They hadn't been seen since the 1980s, most likely due to mining and deforestation. A group of conservationists found the bee after spending five days trekking through the forest. The large, black, wasp-like insect has immense jaws like a stag beetle, with the females measuring in at one and a half inches, or about as big as a human thumb, and a wingspan of two and a half inches. They use their huge jaws like salad tongs to carry resin back to their nest which keeps the termites out. Although it was quite the adventure to locate the species, the team found it in a remote area. Hopefully its elusive nature will help protect the species and ensure its survival for the future. Rainbow Colored Squirrel There are almost 300 species of squirrels in the world, but most of us have only probably seen brown or gray squirrels, maybe the occasional red. But did you know that there is actually a rainbow squirrel? In the case of the Malabar giant squirrel, you will most definitely do a double take if you happen to come across one of these. Found deep in the forests of India, these squirrels are much larger than your average squirrel, measuring up to three feet long. That's a little disconcerting. But their unique coloring, panda-like ears, and bands of multicolored fur make them look like they have just jumped out of the pages of a fantasy novel. Even in pictures, they don't look real. With purple, indigo, and orange coloring, researchers believe they have adapted this shading to confuse predators or to attract mates with their vibrant shades, almost like brightly colored birds. Up until 20 years ago, the Malabar giant squirrel was listed as a vulnerable species in the forests of the Indian Peninsula. Luckily, they have made a comeback and continue to frolic high in the trees, far away from predators. But luckily, close enough for eagle-eyed photographers to snap a few photos to share with nature lovers around the world. Rabbit Spider At first glance, this looks like anything but a spider. Is this even real? Why yes, yes it is. It is actually a very small spider that belongs to the Daddy Longlegs family, officially known as a bunny harvestman spider. To me, it almost looks more like it has a wolf on its back, a scary one. It has a dark body and false yellow eyes along with the two protrusions that look like ears or horns. If you look closely, you can see its real eyes are further down. Scientist Andreas K found this guy in the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador in July 2017. The dots and the ridges that rise from their body resemble bunny ears. I don't know, what do you think? Does it look like a bunny to you or a wolf? It was first described in writings and drawings from a German arachnid specialist named Carl Friedrich Rauver in 1959. Andreas K proposed the theory that this arachnid may have developed the bizarre growths as a way to make itself appear larger than it really is. But to be honest, scientists aren't exactly sure. It's only about the size of a thumb and like other daddy long legs, does not have venom glands, so it poses no threat to humans. This creature has not been studied very much, but it is definitely a good sign that there will be other amazing critters out there to discover. Albino Turtle While this might sound kind of ghostly and weird, albino turtles do exist, but they are anything but dull. Though different species of turtles have different chances of being born with the albinism gene, each has a distinctive look. Some are more yellowish with orange markings while others are pink and fiery red. Albinism in turtles, lizards, and other reptiles presents differently than it does in mammals, birds, and humans, for example. Instead of having no coloring, reptiles tend to have one pigment left in their skin, which is what gives them their red, orange, pink, or yellow shades. One particular species, the albino painted wood turtle, is found on the west coast of Mexico and in Central America. It is one of the rarest morphs in the world, with bright red and yellow markings on its shell and head. One of the main problems for most albino animals is the effect it has on their eyesight. Turtles are no different. Their vision is often impaired, which makes it more difficult for them to find food. It also makes them an easier target because they're unable to spot predators before becoming their victims. Because of this, some albino reptiles don't make it past childhood. They just stand out too much. Lagoon Blob Like something right out of a sci-fi movie, this blob from the lagoon looks like a brain. Found in an artificial lagoon in a Canadian park in Vancouver, this mass isn't actually an it, but a they. 
Even creepier, right? The really cool thing about this life form is that it is actually more than one creature. It is a collection of smaller creatures known as the magnificent bryozoan that form a brain-shaped mass that can be larger than a human head. Also known as moss animals, they are an ancient group of filter feeders. The blob starts off as a single invertebrate that produces clones of itself until it basically creates its own family of minions that float on freshwater reservoirs, filtering out plankton. They glue themselves together to form various shapes including sheets, columns, and branched structures that look like trees. Strangely, organisms such as this don't belong in Canada's Pacific Northwest. They are usually found east of the Mississippi River. Fossil records show ancient marine bryozoans living as far back as 470 million years ago. This particular blob is believed to have been carried by flying ducks or possibly even the breeze, making it a true spectacle discovered north of the border. Blue Lobster while most lobsters are a dull greenish-brown color, fishermen in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia were stunned when they caught two bright blue lobsters while working off the coast. See, there's a lot more going on in Canada than you thought. Considered a sign of good luck amongst the region's fishermen, the probability of capturing such a creature is rare, with a 1 in 2 million chance of such a catch. The strangely colored lobsters look that way due to a genetic mutation that causes them to produce more protein than others. Even though European lobsters have more of a bluish hue, these are bright and vibrant. But this isn't the first time such a rarity was found. In the summer of 2012, a fishing boat captured a blue lobster off the coast of Maryland. Nicknamed Toby, the lobster was not thrown back but saved and later displayed at the National Aquarium in Washington, D.C. Over time, other unique lobsters have been caught in the oceans of the world, including yellow lobsters, calico lobsters, and the albino lobster. There are also cotton candy-colored lobsters that are pink and pale blue. They are considered the rarest of the rare, with about one for every 100 million. Pyrosomes This giant worm-like creature can grow up to 60 feet long. But what is it? Known as a pelagic sea squirt, the delicate yet creepy pyrosomes are actually a collection of thousands of clones that can copy themselves and add to the colony in the same way the lagoon blob does. If they are injured, they can clone more of themselves and keep on going, making them practically immortal. Physically connected by sharing tissues, pyrosome colonies are shaped like a giant tube with a point on one end. The other end has an opening that can sometimes stretch up to six feet wide. Described as gelatinous, they move in unison as one jelly-like body and can also glow on top of everything else. They have bioluminescent qualities that allow them to emit light. Remarkably, when one colony lights up, it can inspire other nearby colonies to do so as well in an underwater display of communication. Who knows what they're saying? They eat plankton and filter the water into the hollow interior of the colony, which propels them forward. With no teeth or tentacles, they in theory pose no harm to other species. But actually, since they are so big, one actually swallowed an entire penguin in front of horrified onlookers. But with not much known about them, these underwater unicorns remain a mystery to most scientists. Orchid Mantis One look at the Orchid Mantis and you will see how this insect gets its name. A startling resemblance to the orchid flower, this mantis is found in tropical forests of Southeast Asia. One of few mantises that imitate flowers, these don't usually choose flowers as their hunting grounds. Their flower-like appearance allows them to hide in plain sight, seeking out patches of green vegetation for ample space to tempt their prey. The females of the species are the ones who display petal-like feet and can even change their color to mimic the vegetation around them, making them even more tempting to unsuspecting insects. Their legs have special lobes that resemble flower petals from the front, with colored accents that can be pink, orange, brown, or green. If you look at them from below, they look just like a regular mantis. Mostly found in Myanmar, Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia, they are carnivorous insects that like to feed on fruit flies, bees, crickets, lizards, and even larger animals like turtles, frogs, and birds. They are also a part of a larger flower mantis family that also mimic other local plants. The devil's mantis looks like a crumpled leaf, while the spiny flower mantis has an entirely white body with a large green eye spot that allows it to blend in with other flowers. Able to both walk and fly, these insects have adapted to their surroundings in such a way that they can blend in easily, but don't be fooled by their beautiful appearance. They can be quite aggressive, and like I mentioned, they can take down animals much larger than themselves, like a lizard or a bird. In comparison, this would be like a human grabbing a grizzly bear and ripping it apart. The females will also eat the males as a snack after mating, or if they are just plain hungry. It happens.
Giant isopods. One look at the giant isopod and you might swear you're staring an alien in the face. A type of crustacean, these sea bottom dwellers live between 550 and 7,000 feet deep. Preferring a mud or clay floor, they like to burrow for shelter and are often found in the Pacific Ocean off Japan and in the South China Sea. They can also get pretty big. Typically measuring between 7.5 and, and 14 inches, some can even grow up to 2.5 feet long. This gigantic size is believed to help the creature withstand the extreme pressure found in their deep ocean homes. Its shell consists of overlapping brown or pale lilac segments. With four sets of jaws to cut and tear prey, they use their two sets of antenna to sense either chemically or physically. They are scavengers eating pretty much anything that falls from above, even in one case an entire alligator. Researchers had tossed one from above so they could record it on camera. These creatures are pretty tough and can actually go years without eating. A researcher taking care of several isopods tried to feed them every day, but they eat about two to ten times per year. That's patience right there. As they grow, they shed their exoskeleton, molting until they reach adulthood. But don't let their alien-like appearance fool you. Although they tend to bite, they also curl up into a ball when threatened, just like their cousin, the pill bug. A two and a half foot long pill bug. White whales. You might be familiar with the infamous whale in Herman Melville's Moby Dick, but white whales aren't just from fiction. One of the smallest whale species, the beluga, is naturally white, so it is hard to confuse them with other species. However, other species of whale that are much more common are very rarely white. That's why a white whale is a metaphor, because they don't really exist, at least very often. In 1991, a rare white humpback whale nicknamed Migaloo was spotted around the Great Barrier Reef. Scientists believe Migaloo, whose name means white fella in the Aboriginal language, was between three and five years of age when first spotted. At that time, he was the only known white whale in the world. That's how rare they are. He is almost completely white with brown eyes and scientists don't really consider him to be a true albino, but rather hypopigmented or leucistic, which refers to a partial loss of pigmentation. He is protected under Australian law, but he has even been given extra protection since he is so unique. Any ship within 500 meters of the white whale will be fined 16,500 Australian dollars. Currently, there are only three to four other known white whales besides Migaloo, a white whale named Baloo, and a calf spotted in 2011 that was named Migaloo Jr. In 2019, a whale watching guide struck gold when he spotted a rare albino gray whale off of Baja California, Mexico. Nicknamed Milk Gallon because of her dazzling white color, she had first been seen during the 2008-2009 whale observation season. In 2016, she was spotted with a calf of her own, which was quite a nice sight to see. Gray whales are highly endangered, and scientists are careful to monitor their numbers. It is believed that Milk Gallon is an albino and most likely has an acute sensitivity to sunshine and is less able to absorb heat in cold waters. However, her large size probably protects her from predators. Gray whales can be up to 50 feet long and weigh 40 tons. If you are ever able to see one of these whales in real life, count yourself lucky as they are one of nature's rarest treasures. Karate Kicking Cockroaches Emerald jewel wasps have a particularly nasty way of finding a place to lay their eggs in a cockroach's brain. Then they get turned into mind-controlled zombies. Once they get stung, there is not much they can do, but the cockroaches that fall victim to this technique have started to develop a surprisingly effective countermeasure. It had long been known that the wasps targeted cockroaches and that they were able to turn them into zombies with their stings. The wasp will grab onto the antenna of the cockroach, then the first strike paralyzes their legs while the second sting goes right to their brain, releasing a neurotoxin that hijacks their nervous system. It changes the way the cockroaches think and alters their behavior. Then the wasp proceeds to snip off the wings, drink the blood, and then steer the roach back to their nest where they implant their eggs. When the newborn wasps hatch, they emerge into the still alive but zombified cockroach and eat it from the inside out. This is something you probably wouldn't even wish onto your worst enemy. Researchers believe that the cockroaches had no way to prevent this grisly fate, but recent observations have found that they have learned how to fend off the wasps before they are able to land their first sting. In about 50% of encounters, roaches stand up on their hind legs and deliver a sharp kick to the head of the wasp, karate style, which either disorients the wasp, knocks it out, or causes severe damage, just like what you would probably do if a zombie is coming at you. 
Fossil rewrites China's history. Fossil discoveries can teach us a lot about the animals that once roamed the Earth, but sometimes a discovery can also make us rethink our complete understanding of the entire planet. In 2018, the remains of a dinosaur were found in northern China, and its presence there tells a new story about the continents. Perhaps the previous ideas of the separation of the planet's continents were wrong. The fossil was from a species of long-necked sauropod called Ling Wulong Shenqi that lived around 174 million years ago. Scientists thought that East Asia had already separated from Pangaea by this time, but if that had been the case, there would have been no way for this species to cross the Great Divide that had formed. Since this fossil is the oldest known example of a sauropod to have been found anywhere on Earth, it means Pangaea must have remained connected at least for several millions of years longer than had been assumed. Ling Wulong appeared where it pretty much shouldn't have, in northern China, 15 million years earlier than any other known dinosaurs from its group. Scientists from Imperial College London were doubly excited. Not only was it the oldest member of its group ever found, but it's the first ever from Asia. Earth 2? Over the past decade, new scientific instruments have allowed researchers to explore the universe like never before. One of the most interesting fields of study is the search for exoplanets, or planets outside of our solar system that orbits a star, much like Earth orbits the Sun. Over the past few years, hundreds of these exoplanets have been found, especially with the help of TESS. NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. One of the most exciting discoveries was TOI-700D. Unlike most planets found that are very different places from our home planet, it is about the same size as Earth and orbits its star at a distance that would allow water to remain liquid. TOI-700D orbits a red dwarf star in the Dorado constellation and is around 101.4 light-years away from us. Simulations have shown that there's a very good chance the surface has the same temperature range, the gravity is about equal to ours, and that it could be made up of many of the same chemical compounds that are on our own planet. It is in the magical Goldilocks zone around its star, so not too close, not too far. Of course, there is still a lot of uncertainty about this planet, including its mass and whether or not it has an atmosphere. However, TESS will once again be pointed at TOI-700 and it might reveal more of its secrets. Egyptian Treasure Archaeologists recently announced the discovery of an important artifact in Egypt and one that they hope may lead them to the location of a long-lost burial chamber. Researchers from Poland were scouring through what appeared to be trash near the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, which is a structure at a complex of ancient tombs on the west bank of the Nile called Deir el-Bahari. Trash sounds bad, but ancient trash is actually chock full of information. One of them noticed something unusual, and when they looked closer, they realized that what initially appeared to be a block of stone was, in fact, a small chest. Inside were a few items carefully wrapped in cloth, such as the remains of a sacrificed goose, a goose egg, and the egg from an ibis. What was very interesting, however, was that there are inscriptions on the chest that refer to Pharaoh Tutmos II, a leader from ancient Egypt whose burial chamber has not yet been found. The researchers think it's possible that this box came from the pharaoh's tomb, so the place has probably already been raided by robbers, but it would still represent a major find if they can use this to help determine its location, and shows that there could still be many more burial sites that are yet to be uncovered. Skull of an Ancient Ancestor It has long been known that humans evolved from the same ancestors as other primates many millions of years ago, but the exact point at which we branched off in a different direction isn't yet fully understood. Our own species, Homo sapiens, are thought to have developed around 100,000 years ago, but a recent discovery in Ethiopia is thought to be the remains of one of the earliest known direct human ancestors who lived in the region around 3.8 million years ago. Called Australopithecus anamensis, it's thought to be a direct ancestor of Lucy, the famous ancient hominid which was once our oldest known relative. This newly discovered species represents the time at which our ancestors first emerged from the trees, and even though they walked on two legs, they still had distinctively ape-like features, particularly in their faces and jawlines. Their brains were about a quarter of the size that ours are today, and the skull that was found already shows signs that teeth were developing to become like ours, in order to allow them to eat a variety of different foods. 
It's still thought that there are a few missing pieces before we fully understand our entire evolutionary history, but this recent discovery gets us a whole lot closer. Medieval Sword in Danish Sewer Searching through a sewer, you might not expect to find anything too useful among all the sludge and the waste, but in early 2019, a team of engineers found something unexpected – a medieval sword. They were cleaning the thick layers of waste from around the pipe when something rigid began to emerge, and after removing it for further research, it was found that it dated back to the 1300s. It was still surprisingly sharp and had a double-edged blade which would have only been available to the wealthiest people of the time. Perhaps it belonged to a member of the royal family or one of their elite guards. Dents and grooves in the blade suggest that it had been well used, probably across three or four different battles, and it certainly would have been a feared weapon on the medieval battlefields. Quite how it managed to get into the sewer is not entirely clear, though, and once it was thoroughly cleaned, it was given to the History Museum in the Danish town of Aalborg to be put on permanent display. Giant Dinosaur Bone In 2019, scientists in southwestern France uncovered an enormous dinosaur thigh bone at an excavation site. Measured to be 6.6 .6 feet long, or 2 meters, the thigh bone is believed to belong to a sauropod, one of the largest land animals that ever existed. They were herbivores with a long neck and tail. The bone was so well preserved you can see the dents of muscles, tendons, and scars. These sauropods walked the earth around 140 million years ago and weighed about 40 to 50 metric tons. The femur bone alone took about a week to remove from the ground and weighs about 1,102 pounds. They needed a crane to get it out. A large pelvic bone was also found nearby. At this site, located near the town of Cognac, France, scientists have been excavating fossils since 2010. So far, over 7,500 fossils have been found from at least 40 different species, including Stegosaurus and a herd of ostrich dinosaurs. With all of those fossils, you'd think that this leg bone was just one more, but this was actually a major discovery. Most big bones like this shatter into many pieces. Aged Beer Construction workers were digging up a parking lot in the city of Leeds in the UK when they uncovered the remains of an old building that had long been covered over, along with hundreds of perfectly preserved products that had been made there. The thing that made this find special, though, was that the building used to be a pub, and there were hundreds of bottles of beer. Thought to be at least 100 years old, the 600 bottles were neatly stacked outside the former Scarborough Castle Inn, and thanks to having been placed underneath the cellar stairs, they hadn't been crushed by all of the stone and rock that had been used to build on top of it. The majority of the bottles still had their labels on, which said J.E. Richardson of Leeds, and mostly contained ginger beer. This isn't something that would be recommended to drink these days because analysis of the fluid found an extremely high lead content, which is most likely due to the lead pipes that were used in the brewing process. That's too bad. A Moscow mule sounds kind of good right now. It's a unique insight into the history of the region and the people that lived there, and shows that even though society may have progressed a lot since then, at the end of the day, people still just wanted to sit back, relax, and have a beer. A new continent. How many continents do you think there are on Earth? While the usual answer is seven, the more we learn about the makeup of our planet, the more we learn that its structure is much more complicated than we had realized. There is now evidence to suggest that there's actually a separate continent between Europe and Africa that's called Greater Adria. It's separated from a supercontinent called Gondwana several hundred million years ago, detached from what is now North Africa about 200 million years ago, and then began to collide with Europe and slid beneath it. Before most of it disappeared, it would have been mostly underwater, but full of coral reefs, tropical oceans, and archipelagos. There is, however, still part of it that you can step foot on, and it's the strip of land between Turin and the Adriatic Sea, what we see as being the boot of Italy, and some of the mountain peaks of the Alps are made from its rock. Goliath the Massive Tadpole In ponds and slow-flowing rivers at the right time of year, you might find thousands of tadpoles swimming around just waiting to become toads and frogs. But how big do you think one of these creatures can actually grow to be? In 2018, while researchers investigated the remains of a drained pond in Arizona, they found what they think is the largest one on record, and it was an absolute monster. At larger than the size of a regular can of Coke and about the same length as a banana, this tadpole, affectionately known as Goliath, 
was initially thought to be a fish before they looked closer. It was an American bullfrog tadpole, and while the adult animals can become around 8 inches long, their young are not normally anywhere near that size. It's not known quite why Goliath became so big, but it has been suggested that it was as a result of a hormone imbalance that meant that it just kept growing and growing. I wonder how big of a frog he became. You have to wonder how many others like this are hidden in the waterways. Bus sized sea monster. When researchers unearthed a prehistoric sea monster in Nevada, they ended up uncovering the first ocean predator that had evolved to eat prey its own size. An animal that lived 244 million years ago, the Latoarchon sarophagus, which translates to lizard eating sovereign of the sea, was as big as a bus and part of a group of reptiles swimming in the ocean called ichthyosaurs. They looked like large, toothy porpoises and dolphins, and were not dinosaurs. Excavated in 1998, the Thalato Archon fossil was remarkably well preserved, with researchers finding the skull, fins, and the entire vertebral column. They were pretty excited, seeing that it was such a large animal. It was estimated to be about 28 feet long, with a large head and teeth about 4 inches tall. A group of National Geographic explorers spotted some of the animal's fearsome teeth on the last day of their expedition returning 12 years later to dig up the rest of the fossil. When they did, they discovered an enormous jaw that had large sharp teeth big enough to eat other large marine reptiles. Other animals that would compare in size today to Thalato Archon are great white sharks and maybe orcas who are also able to take on similar sized prey. One of the other remarkable things about this find is the fact that Thalato Archon reappeared quickly after the biggest mass extinction event in Earth's history. At the time, up to 95% of all species in the ocean were wiped out, but a predator like Thalato Archon returning so quickly shows that there was still enough food for this monster-sized creature to eat. Even though it thrived for 160 million years, Thalato Archon and other ichthyosaurs went extinct, leaving behind no living relatives. New Plesiosaur In 2010, David Bratt, a resident of Montana, was out hunting elk when he ventured into a canyon and discovered what he thought was petrified wood coming out of some rock. After taking a closer look, Brad realized what he thought was wood was actually a fossilized vertebrae of a large animal. Armed with photos of his find, Brad reported the discovery to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Museum of the Rockies in Montana. It took three days for researchers to completely excavate the fossils, and nearly seven years to clean and examine them. After doing so, researchers were able to identify this specimen as a smaller, previously unknown species of a marine reptile from the Elasmosaurus family. It had an extremely long neck. Actually, its neck alone was about 23 feet long. The entire body would have probably measured about 34 feet long. See? An amazing find, discovered by accident. The skeleton was found in an area that 70 to 80 million years ago would have been covered by an ocean. Stretching from Montana to Minnesota and from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, the water teemed with marine reptiles, many of which have never been excavated before. So heavy that they could not raise their bodies above the water, elasmosaurs were able to approach unsuspecting prey without alerting them to their whereabouts. The first complete Elasmosaurus was found in 1868 in Kansas. Researchers originally thought that the species had a very long tail, but they later realized they were looking at the remains the wrong way around, and what they thought was the tail was in fact the neck. Although they have been found all over the world, the one found in Montana had a shorter neck that was less than half the length of other known Elasmosaurs. One of the smallest adult Elasmosaurus ever discovered, this new find shows that the smaller species lived around the same time as the other, contradicting an earlier theory about how these prehistoric sea creatures evolved. Allosaurus As one of the earliest dinosaur discoveries ever, a number of Allosaurus fossils have been found by paleontologists, so it's a lot of people's favorite. A carnivorous dinosaur that moved around on two legs, it lived around 150 million years ago during the late Jurassic period. It is the most common dinosaur fossil found in Utah's Cleveland Lloyd Quarry, a site that has the densest concentration of Jurassic dinosaur bones in the world. So it is also Utah's state fossil. 74 individual dinosaurs have been found in the quarry, and 46 of them have been Allosaurus specimens. Still, most of the Allosaurus fossils found to date come from an area in Wyoming and Colorado known as the Morrison Formation. They have also been found around the globe in Portugal, Siberia, and Tanzania. The Allosaurus, whose name means different lizard, was named because vertebrae were different from other dinosaurs noted at the time when it was discovered in 1877. Some of the vertebrae were concave on both sides and had shallow cavities that gave them an hourglass shape. 
This made the bones less strong and lighter, similar to back vertebrae found in modern birds. They may have also had air sacs for respiration. Up to eight different species of Allosaurus have been found in the last 30 years. A massive carnivore, they grew from 39 to 43 feet long and stood from 15 to 16 feet tall with a short neck and narrow, elongated skull. The Allosaurus also had a pair of small horns above its eyes and ridges along the top of its nasal bones to the horns. Their massive body was supported by two powerful hind limbs and a large tail, each foot with three weight-bearing toes and an inner claw. Believed to have dined mostly on other large dinosaurs, they were capable of killing gigantic sauropods. A fierce, aggressive predator, the Allosaurus was a large, fearsome thing that was able to tear flesh with its slashing teeth. As specimens continue to be unearthed, the one discovery by a team in 1996 remains the best preserved skeleton to date. Megatherium Although you might not think a sloth would be particularly terrifying, you might think differently once you see the Megatherium. A 13-foot sloth that lived in the prehistoric Amazon, Megatherium was one of the largest ground mammals to have ever existed. It dominated the continent's southern grasslands and forests for thousands of years before being wiped from the planet in a mass extinction event. An archaeologist named Manuel Torres discovered fossil specimens in eastern Argentina in 1787. At first, not recognizing it, he sent it back to the Spanish National Museum of Natural History in Madrid. There, it was reassembled and mounted for display, catching the eye of a French paleontologist who wanted to know more about this creature. Eight years later, the paleontologist named Georges Cuvier published a paper in which he theorized Megatherium was a giant sloth, maybe even an early ancestor of modern sloths. He believed it used its claws to climb trees, but then later changed his theory believing that the sloth was much too big to climb trees, and instead used its claws to dig subterranean holes. These large tunnels have been found in South America from Colombia to southern Argentina. The largest land mammal second only to the woolly mammoth, Megatherium walked on all four legs and was able to stand on its hind legs to reach treetop foliage, standing upwards of 13 feet tall when it did so. They thrived for over 5 million years, but are believed to have gone extinct in 8500 BC when the Quaternary Extinction Event occurred, wiping out most of Earth's large mammals. As scientists continue to believe these elephant-sized sloths went extinct 4,000 years ago, rumors of giant sloths living deep in the jungles of South America continue to emerge. Local tribes tell tales of a dangerous giant sloth-like creature over 7 feet tall with large, sharp claws. Is it possible that Megatherium survived extinction by staying within the shelter of the rainforest? With some believing that the mass extinction event was partly caused by human invasion of the habitat, it's possible Megatherium could have evaded extinction. But until one is actually found roaming around the Amazon, stories of this massive creature lurking in the jungle will continue to be just that. Gorgonops a creature that lived in southern Africa during the late Permian era, Gorgonops was a mammal that had distinctly reptile-like characteristics. Measuring 6 to 10 feet long from snout to tail, Gorgonops, whose name translates to Gorgon face, was discovered in the 1800s. If you thought this creature got its name from the Gorgons in Greek mythology, such as Medusa, it's kind of close. Their name actually comes from the word Gorgos, which means dreadful. It was kind of a cross between a Tyrannosaurus and a saber-toothed cat from the late Permian when Pangaea was around. Researchers believe they were a warm-blooded creature, meaning they could have had a layer of fur over their bodies, even though most pictures show them looking a lot more like a lizard. The problem with researching the Gorgonops is that not enough fossils have been found in order to get a clear picture on just what this creature was like. Scientists do believe it was a predator, since it had a mouthful of large teeth, with two fang-like canine teeth for slicing. Its fangs were so big they protruded below the creature's jaw, and the front part of its jaw was thicker in order to protect those teeth, which worked the same way as for some saber-toothed cats. So until more are uncovered, this hunter remains a mysterious predator linked to southern Africa's prehistoric past. Giant Sea Scorpion Scorpions are bad enough with their intimidating claws and venomous stinger, but an 18-inch stinger is on a whole other level. It belonged to Gigalopterus renaniae, a massive 8.2-foot-long sea scorpion. 
Discovered near Prum, Germany, the fossil proves that arthropods like insects, spiders, and crabs once grew a lot larger than scientists thought. The largest arthropod ever found, Gigalopterus lived 500 to 250 million years ago in freshwater rivers and lakes and possibly hunted other arthropods and fish. So how did prehistoric creatures like the sea scorpion get so big compared to their current counterparts? In prehistoric times, there was an elevated level of oxygen 400 million years ago, making up 30% of the Earth's atmosphere versus today's 21%. When it comes to aquatic animals, other factors like environmental resources and competition among other animals also played a part. Some scientists also believe that they didn't really have larger predators around to control them, so these giant beasts could live more peacefully and relaxed than others. Whatever the reason, the discovery of this creature, an ancestor of scorpions and possibly all arachnids, solves another piece of the arthropods' evolutionary puzzle. Hammer-headed herbivore In 2014, a paleontologist from the Canadian Museum of Nature discovered a new species of reptile in China. This sea creature was called Atopodentatus unicus and lived between two 247 and 242 million years ago. It had a head the shape of a vacuum cleaner, and it is the earliest known plant-eating marine reptile. After discovering most of its skeleton and part of its skull, scientists uncovered the creature's bizarre mouth. The reptile had 35 small needle-like teeth on both sides of its mouth, and another 140 in the rest of the upper jaw that scientists believe were used to filter water while feeding. Not strong enough to catch prey, the teeth would have been used to filter microorganisms or just for plants. When more specimens were found in 2016, scientists got a better idea of the creature's makeup. Newly discovered fossils point to the creature having a type of hammerhead skull. Instead of the drooping nose originally theorized, this new find shows that the Atopodentatus used this feature to rummage around on the seabed for food. The deposit where this creature was found is revealing many more new things. Paleontologists are excited that this is just the beginning of the story. Horned Dinosaur Entombed for 68 million years, a dinosaur with distinct facial horns was found along a Canadian riverbank in 2005. But horned dinosaurs like this are rarely unearthed in this part of the world. Nicknamed Hellboy for its stubby horns that are similar to the comic book character, Regaliceratops Peter Husey, which means royal horned face, was found along the Old Man River in southwestern Alberta after the tip of its snout was discovered sticking out of a cliff. Alive during the end of the age of the dinosaurs, Regaliceratops had a large cone-shaped horn over its nose as well as a pair of small curved horns over its eyes much smaller compared to the ones owned by its close relative, Triceratops, as well as a bony frill. Triangular and pentagon-shaped bone spines formed a halo or crown around its face. While most fossils are found squashed flat, Hellboy's skull was well-preserved, allowing scientists to study the Cretaceous period plant eater. Similar in size to today's largest rhinos, Hellboy weighed about one and a half tons, making it a painstakingly difficult task for geologists to extricate it from the hard rock. Luckily, they were successful, and now the fossil, which has traits shared by two different horned dinosaurs, suggests that many similar species could still be uncovered. Animals taking over streets As many people continue to be on lockdown, animals have taken to the city streets. We have boars in Spain and Italy, horses and sheep all over the place, deer in London and Japan, and moose in Lithuania. Even more cautious predators are coming down from their hiding places like coyotes in San Francisco and bears and mountain lions who are now roaming through neighborhoods. A man reported to board Panda that he saw an alligator strolling in Myrtle Beach in broad daylight. He said at first he thought someone was playing a joke on him, but nope, it was real. The only other person around, a security guard, almost ran right into it. They were both shocked as many people thought there weren't even gators in the area known as Barefoot Landing, especially not in the parking lot. Italy's waterways are clearer. Italy, one of the coronavirus pandemic's hardest hit countries, went into a nationwide lockdown on March 9th, heavily restricting movement within its borders and only allowing necessary travel. Venice, which is normally packed with tourists, is seeing hardly any boat traffic in its famous canals. As a result, in the time since the quarantine went into effect, the water has become its clearest in 60 years. It's so pristine, in fact, that you can see all kinds of fish swimming around. There is much less boat traffic that usually brings sediment to the surface. Without boats constantly churning it up non-stop, sediment remains at the bottom, making the canal seem much cleaner and more beautiful than they already are. The mayor has also pointed out that fewer boats and other vehicles means less pollution, leading to improved air quality. 
There have also been claims of swan and dolphin sightings in the Venice canals, providing society at large with hope of what types of animals are reclaiming territory they were previously pushed out of and where they're doing it. However, National Geographic has confirmed that swans and dolphins have not actually come to Venice. Even though photographs and videos have gone viral on Instagram and TikTok, they aren't actually in Venice. However, the good news is that the dolphins were filmed at a port in Sardinia in southern Italy and swans are native to the nearby island of Burano, near Venice. It's an unexpected side effect of the pandemic. People are excited to have some good news and that at least something good can come out of this time of crisis. It's understandable that people are sharing feel-good posts without being overly concerned with fact-checking and their intentions are mostly good. I think people really want to believe in the power of nature to recover. Psychology and Environmental Studies professor Susan Clayton from the College of Worcester in Ohio told National Geographic, People hope that no matter what we've done, nature is powerful enough to rise above it. You have to admit, it is nice to see good news in these suddenly difficult times. Endangered turtles are nesting in peace. The olive ridley turtle is a kind of sea turtle threatened by coastal development, hunting, and fishing equipment, and its numbers are rapidly declining. Only one of every 1,000 hatchlings makes it to adulthood, meaning that protective action is necessary or likely will be at some point. For now, the newfound quiet that comes along with quarantines and shelter-in-place orders is serving as a de facto conservation method of sorts in some areas. Olive Ridley's at India's Rushikulia Beach, a popular tourist attraction, are benefiting from a quieter habitat during nesting season. Every year, turtles travel to the beach en masse to nest. Their slightly late arrival this year meant they had the beach to themselves, or at least didn't have to share it with humans, giving the Olive Ridley's more space and a calmer environment than they're used to. Whether this will lead to more of their hatchlings surviving remains to be seen, but fingers crossed that they have more of a fighting chance. Other animals are benefiting during India's lockdown, including estuarine crocodiles who are enjoying the beaches at Jolly Buoy Island in the Andaman Archipelago, where they normally have limited access because they avoid humans. While on lockdown, people are noticing an increased bird presence, especially in and around Delhi, which is already well known for its avian diversity. Prabhat Verma, a resident who took up bird watching from his eighth floor balcony, recently told The Week that he spotted 30 different bird species in three days. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and share your experiences with animals during lockdown in the comments below. We'd love to hear them. Nitrogen dioxide pollution decreased in China. The term economic slowdown generally doesn't mean anything good, but China, which is notorious for its smog-infested cities, is seeing a few major unintended benefits. Shortly after the outbreak began and quarantines went into effect throughout China in December of last year, the skies became noticeably bluer and clearer, including in Wuhan, which is well known for its heavy smog and where the air quality has long been a public health concern. Satellite images captured by NASA show that since the beginning of this year, China has experienced a sustained decrease in nitrogen dioxide pollution. The same thing happened in Italy after the country went into lockdown, as evidenced by data and video footage gathered by the European Space Agency. While the terrifying coronavirus pervades the planet, resulting in less cars on the road, fewer industrial facilities in operation, and less harmful human activity in general, the environment is paradoxically becoming healthier in certain ways. Hopefully we will remember this and take notice. Marshall Burke, a scientist and Earth Systems professor at Stanford University, is trying to figure out if reduced pollution resulting from current travel restrictions and other pandemic-related policies could ultimately save more lives than COVID-19 may end up taking. This is a bold assertion, and Burke himself admits that there are limitations to his methods, including the fact that he has only considered one of the many air pollutants that are harmful to humans. His experiment may not last long anyway, as China's NO2 emissions have already returned to their pre-pandemic levels. Mountain Goats in Welsh Town To limit the spread of coronavirus, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson recently imposed a stay-at-home order, allowing for very few exceptions. It's the most restrictive movement policy the UK has seen since World War II. A few days later, residents of Clandidno, a seaside resort town in northern Wales, I don't think I said that right, spotted herds of great Ormi Kashmiri goats roaming the streets. They traveled down from their usual home atop the Great Ormi Headland, a 679-foot chunk of limestone that rises from the sea and overlooks the town, to graze in flower beds and outside churches and homes. They were kind of surprised, looking around to see where all the people had gone. 
Some residents claim that while the goats sometimes travel to the foot of the Great Ormi, they rarely venture into the streets. But with few cars and people around, they decided to step outside their usual boundaries and do some exploring and eating. Penny Ando, a local counselor, told CNN that in 33 years of living in the area, she'd never seen goats gallivanting around. Others, including the North Wales police, who were contacted about the uninvited visitors, weren't too surprised to see goats wandering around town. Knowing that the goats would probably go back to where they came from once people go back out, law enforcement did not confront them. Carbon dioxide emissions declined. So I told you how nitrogen dioxide emissions decreased throughout China and Italy after quarantines went into effect. Carbon dioxide pollution also dropped to the tune of 25% over a four-week period, according to a Carbon Brief report. During the quarantine, coal and oil industrial activities operated at below normal levels. For example, in Shandong province, oil refinery operations were at their lowest since 2015, and average coal consumption at power plants hit their lowest in four years. Annually, this only amounts to a 1% decrease in CO2 emissions. Moreover, the decline was short-lived. By the end of March, China's emissions and energy demand returned to their pre-crisis levels. Monkeys are rioting in Thailand. In early March, Facebook user Sasaluk Ratanachai captured video footage of a mob of macaques running around a plaza and engaging in a massive brawl at the Pra Prang Sam Yat Monkey Temple in Lop Buri, Thailand. It's normal for the Lop Buri primates to fight, but their behavior in the video indicates that resources are scarce. Ecologist Asmita Sengupta, who studies the effects of people feeding macaques, told the New York Times. Like at many other wild animal parks throughout Asia, these macaques rely almost exclusively on tourists for food. Amid the coronavirus pandemic and the travel restrictions that come with it, they are not receiving many visitors. China is Thailand's biggest source of tourists, and last month the number of visitors from the country fell by 85%, meaning the monkeys aren't getting enough to eat. The creatures at the Monkey Temple constitute a small portion of the thousands of wild animals in Asia who depend on humans for their meals. The lack of visitors and ensuing food shortage, as well as the macaque's erratic behavior, highlight the problems that can arise when animals become accustomed to receiving food from people, including aggressive behavior resulting from not being fed. Noise pollution has decreased in cities. If you've ever lived in a bustling city, you probably eventually became so used to noise you could sleep through everything from ambulances to trains and the crying baby in the apartment next door, with only a paper-thin wall separating you from his or her high-pitched screams. In fact, the thought of a quiet city might strike you as apocalyptic or eerie. Rightfully so, it turns out. As public transportation operates on a drastically reduced schedule, non-essential businesses remain shuttered, tourists are conspicuously absent, and urban dwellers stay cooped up indoors or travel several feet away from one another and in smaller groups than normal, so cities have become noticeably quiet. During her outdoor walks, Boston University public health researcher Erica Walker took a decibel meter and measured noise levels. She discovered that the urban landscape not only seems practically devoid of man-made sounds, it pretty much is. The pre-crisis acoustic levels at Kenmore Square, a busy intersection near Boston University, measured around 90 decibels, according to writer Marina Corrin for The Atlantic. After social distancing, shelter-in-place, and other policies went into effect to slow the spread of coronavirus, Walker's meter recorded a rush hour rating of just 68 decibels. In some parts of Boston, she detected noise pollution decreases of up to 30 decibels. And as things quiet down and nature creeps its way into cities, people are hearing sounds they're not used to. Two days into Wuhan's quarantine, Rebecca Franks, an American who lives in the city, heard birds chirping. I used to think there weren't really birds in Wuhan because you rarely saw them and never heard them, she wrote in a Facebook post. I now know that they were just muted and crowded out by the traffic and people. All day long now I hear birds singing. It stops me in my tracks to hear the sound of their wings. These calming, pleasant sounds of nature are one of the few enjoyable impacts of the pandemic, and they'll once again become obscured by the sounds of everyday life when things return to normal and people resume socializing and go back to work. My advice? If the area you live in is unusually quiet and wildlife is making its presence known, enjoy it while you can. Deer are invading a Japanese city. Nara Park, a 1,240-acre public park and popular tourist attraction located in Nara, Japan, is home to over 1,000 free-roaming Sika deer. Many of these gentle creatures, who are considered sacred messengers of the Shinto gods, are trained to bow to visitors for treats. Like the macaques in Thailand, the Sika deer at Nara Park depend on tourists for food. 
visitors pay $1.85 for a stack of rice crackers to feed to the deer. But in recent weeks, as the Japanese government strengthened travel restrictions and began quarantining Chinese and South Korean tourists, visitors to Nara Park have slowed to a trickle at best, and the deer are hungry. Although they rarely leave the park, they've taken to the streets of Nara in search of food. People are spotting them in herds of 10 to 15 in places like subway stations and in the middle of traffic. They are eating residents' plants, and some are even becoming aggressive and biting people who feed them. Urban ecologist Dr. Christopher Schell told the New York Times that while it may be tempting to feed the deer who are wandering the city, it's best to just leave them alone, rather than encourage them to stick around in an urban environment, where they're at risk of being hit by cars and ingesting plastic and other hazardous materials. He maintains a positive outlook for the deer and for other wild animals who are ironically not used to fending for themselves. Most animals living in urban environments already have flexible diets, so chances are good that a lot of these animals are going to be okay. Raccoons at Panama Beach As the coronavirus pandemic sweeps the globe, tourism has ground to a halt in San Felipe, Panama, much like it has everywhere else. Restaurants and bars are closed, beaches and streets are empty, and very few people are passing through. Matt Larson, the director of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, recently spotted some unexpected visitors at the beach. There were three raccoons just frolicking along right at the edge of the surf, he told The Guardian. I've lived here six years and it was something I'd never seen before. The beach is normally crowded with visitors and patrolled by security guards, but with nobody there to stop them, the raccoons did as they pleased. While some people consider these animals pests, Larson enjoyed seeing them. It was nice to see something a little out of the ordinary, he said, raccoons dipping their toes in the water. Ecologist Paige Warren warned that life in quarantine may affect wildlife in other unexpected ways. For example, more species may become curious or emboldened, appearing in places we normally never see them, including American cities. On the other hand, she said that we may see less of certain creatures, including those who rely on humans to feed them or eat out of garbage cans. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and stay healthy. Be sure to subscribe and share your lockdown stories in the comments below. See you soon. Bye.